And I think it's one of the most important things to remember, whether it's demonic oppression, demonic possession, whether it's anything else that happens in life, nothing will occur without the Lord allowing it to occur. Like I tell the people here, you're either with Christ or you're with the devil. Mm -hmm. There's no in between. But I tell people for young men, almost everybody I've met, weird things occur. It could be your parents. It could be your wife. It could be car accidents to try to shake your faith in the direction that you're going. In times of adversity but thee, O Lord of hosts, have mercy on us. In regards to encountering the devil, I figured you could be the first first person on the channel to really articulate an important thing that people have mentioned in the chat, but nobody's really explicated, is the idea of demonic possession and the Orthodox Church. And obviously within our culture and the cultural milieu is the Catholic priest and the movie The Exorcist and these very radical understandings of, of demonic possession, which we believe is absolutely true and, and possible, but I think we take a little bit of a different perspective. And so could you speak to, as Orthodox Christians, how do we understand demonic possession and its relationship with sin or the perpetuation of potential sins? First of all, I'm just a young, dumb priest. So I'm no <laughs> expert about these things. I think the expert was, and we can say is because uh, he's still alive, is Iran de Ephraim of mm -hmm. Philotheo in Arizona, mm -hmm. and anyone in his, um, I guess I would call it spiritual lineage, who sat at his feet and learned. I mean, we have Iranda Paisios and St. Anthony's. These are the guys, if you ever could get a hold of them to have a little, little chat. The reality is, and I think it's one of the most important things to remember, whether it's demonic oppression, demonic possession, whether it's anything else that happens in life, nothing will occur without the Lord allowing it to occur. Of course, the Lord honors our free will, and that includes how we live our lives and what sort of things we participate in. If we're gonna participate in impurities and sinful things, things that are outside the commandments of Christ that are destructive, we're not somehow floating around in some gray area. It's either you are, like I tell the people here, you're either with Christ or you're with the devil. Mm -hmm. There's no in between. There's no in between. Of course, if you are against the Lord, at least in, in uh, the way you live your life, the devil doesn't just come right out and tackle you to the ground. He'll play the long game. He'll play the uh, deceitful, secretive game to not make it so obvious. And I think this is what blows people's minds when they come to the true faith, the orthodox faith. They come to know Christ as he revealed himself to the world. They say, I couldn't even, I can't even believe this is what was happening to me. Or they become catechumens <laughs> and then things hit the fan yes. the next day. I mean, yes. th these are real things. Absolutely. Uh, Father, uh, I don't mean to interrupt you, but this sure. was something that just happened um, here at my parish. I'm actually the spiritual godfather of a young man who joined, and I we mm -hmm. were telling him because the priest uh, offered to bring him in this Holy Saturday, this past Pascha. Yeah. And I was telling him about the spiritual battle and, hey, be yeah. careful. You know, things are going to ramp up, but don't be afraid of it. What, you know, just keep going forward, attending services. And unfortunately for him, um, his anxiety ramped up. This was something that he was dealing with, I guess, earlier in his life. It's kind of dissipated. And as soon as he was informed two weeks before that he was going to be brought in, he'd been a catechumen for a year, it yeah. started to come back. And unfortunately, he hasn't been back to church since Holy Saturday. Oh, and, um, wow. and, this, wow. and this is something I, I, I reach out to him. I talk to him. But um, this is a real what, thing. that he say I, to you? He just says it's too much. Yeah, he he just says the anxiety is too much that he he wasn't even driving, so he couldn't he couldn't not only could he not come to church, he said that he couldn't yeah. go to work and he was on work relief, um, and he hasn't been back yet. And we've uh, we've said, yeah, hey, you want to you know just come for men's group, you don't have to come for liturgy. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of people listening when we talk about welcome to the arena and the spiritual battle once you get brought yeah. in, some people think it's kind of a joke or maybe it's like. Uh, you know, a, a symbolic. And I tell, especially for symbolic. young men, at the same time, we had an older man who came into the church and he had a euphoric experience. And then, but I tell people for young men, almost everybody I've met, weird things occur. And, and, and it could be your parents. It could be your wife. It could be just oh, yeah. strange things occur, uh, car accidents to try to shake your faith in the direction that you're going. Mm -hmm. All of the above. And, if 
if these things wait until they are about to be brought in, that's one thing to say. I mean, so much happens right after you're made a catechumen. And this actually reminds me of, I don't know how many months ago it was, we were making catechumens here in the church. And so I take them to the back. I do the exorcism prayers, the renunciations, the affirmations, all of these sort of things. And I'm smiling for a reason. I'll tell you why. I'm doing these prayers of exorcism. I can't remember how many catechumens there were, maybe three or four. I mean, people being made catechumens all in a row back there. And suddenly all the lights in the church started blinking. But it wasn't not just flickering because the power cut out. It was here, and then it was there, and it was that one, and then it was that one, and it was the main chandelier. And it, my back is turned. I don't stop the prayers, but I'm thinking, which one of my kids is messing with the remote right now? I'm thinking, which one of them got away? And one of the adults in between uh, one of the prayers told me, it's no one. It's no one. This continued. This is in front of the whole parish. This is a Sunday morning at the end of Orthodox, after the doxology, before the liturgy starts. Mm. And so everyone witnessed it, and I was able to say a few words about it, how real it is, and how serious it is. This uh, prank with the lights, it didn't stop until, I believe it was the aligning with Christ in the beginning of the Nicene Creed. Mm. And it stopped. Wow. So from the beginning all the way through that, on and off. It's pretty, I mean, it's, it's the real deal. It's serious business. Right. And we explained to people, like we were speaking about demonic possession, demonic oppression, there are things that happen in our life, whether we participate in it or not, or whether it's our family that does. And there are so many stories of people, and I think you know this, that suffer because of family and friends and the environment they grew up in. Of course, there is trauma, there's abuse, there's spiritual trauma, and there's spiritual abuse. And people carry this throughout their entire lives, scarred and wounded and impacted, and the demons can follow them. The demons mm -hmm. latch onto them. This is why it's so important to have these prayers of exorcism for the catechumens, to help them be rid of these things. And we see this in the life of the church, in the lives of the saints. In the life of St. Nectarios of Aegina, I always come back to this. It was the first Orthodox book I was given and I read. It was, in fact, before I even met my spiritual father. And I was about 21 years old. Uh, I was kind of coming to my senses a little bit with God's help at that age. And I remember reading the book, and he was, it was speaking about how St. Nectarios freed a young girl who was possessed by a demon because her father cursed her. Her father cursed her. Her father blasphemed, used the Lord's name in vain, and the demon went into the daughter. Do you, wow. see how we, do you see how we impact each other? And this is over in Greece, of course. I'm from Lebanon. I can, uh, I can easily picture this with the Mediterranean loose tongue and temper. The things you say, it's a terrible joke, but it's a joke, but it's actually serious and real and disgusting. When you are being um, cursed at, rebuked, whatever it might be, by a uh, wild-tempered person in Lebanon, let's say, the words they say are actually against themselves, the curse words, and mm. against your mother and against this and that. This impacts everybody. I mean, if you just take that and you connect it with Elder Thaddeus' book, Our Thoughts Determine Our Lives, mm -hmm. how we can sow peace in the world by our thoughts, or we can sow evil in the world by our thoughts. And of course, more than our thoughts are, in, are our own words, which come from the thoughts. Mm -hmm. These things are so related and so connected, and it's so serious. We're kind of jumping around a little bit, but I can't think about explaining much about demonic possession without mentioning that how the Lord, nothing happens without the Lord allowing it. Of course, in union with our free will, the choices we decide to make on how to live our life and the sort of things we decide to participate in, which I hope we can get into all sorts of things people are participating in today, as they always have been, and probably even more fervently today, and probably with less of an excuse. At the same time, we have to explain the difference between possession and oppression. I have heard and I have learned, and at least I should say I've been, I've been told, demonic possession is much more rare than demonic oppression. Mm -hmm. Okay, demonic oppression. <clears throat> it doesn't take much to be oppressed by the demons. 
if you want to participate in uh, psychic readings, you want to participate in rubbing crystals together in the river underneath a moon, dancing around because you think it's going to help your emotions and it's going to help you manifest the future. If you want to begin to communicate as if uh, this is your best made up friend with your, uh, your spirit guide and you want to begin to make decisions based on that, what do you think is going to happen to you? What do you think is going to happen to you when you come to the knowledge of the truth and you begin to learn about Christ, who is the only way to the Father, who is the resurrection, who is the life? What do you think is going to happen? The demon is going to let you go and run off? Not at all. The oppression will begin to be manifested. You might have been oppressed already this whole time, but they stayed in the back. They left you alone. What do they care? You're howling at the moon with your, with your sisters out in the lawn. <laughs> right. What do they care? They already got you. They already got you. What, and this is why the catechumenate, this is why it's so significant, so important. This is why the baptism is so important. This is why someone coming into the church, even into the temple, is so important because now the demons become afraid. <laughs>